So, welcome back to Unidentified Signal on 99.9 FM, where as day turns tonight, we dive into the weird and unknown. I'm here with my co-host today, who's got something interesting for us tonight. Do I know what it is? Absolutely not. So let's figure that out together, shall we? DK, what do you have for us this evening? So this evening, uh, before I get into it, uh, I need to offer the listeners uh, a little bit of a warning. Uh, There are parts of this broadcast that might be a little unsettling and maybe a little uncomfortable in its description. Uh, There's nothing overtly gross or obscene, uh, but it's still worth mentioning that there are some graphic descriptions to come. So just be aware of that and keep your hand on the dial. So, Uh, I present to you uh, a story that, well, it's not really a story. It actually happened uh, that up until now you had maybe only heard about through sort of like whispers and memes on your Twitter timeline. Uh, It's a story with a really ominous name, and it's sort of this crazy tale of like the hubris of man, you know, sort of Icarus flying too close to the sun, uh, his wings melting and sending him screaming burning, scorched back to earth, back to reality. So today, uh, I am going to present to you the real-life story behind the Demon Core. Ooh, the Demon Core. Okay, the Demon I'm interested. Core. Have, have you ever heard of the Demon Core before, Slap? <laughs> I, I have not. I have not. Oh, not even, not even like, uh, on, on your Twitter timeline or anything, because that's where... That's where that's the only place I ever heard about this before. And it was always this depiction of like, you know, some guy goofily laughing with a screwdriver in his hand. I have no idea where it came from. So today we're going to find out about the Demon Core. Well, I'm so, excited to hear about this. Mm, mm, well, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so <laughs> our our story begins near the end of World War Two in 1945. Uh, The United States, wanting to bring a swift and decided end to the war, had just dropped the fat man and little boy bombs on Japan. Uh, The world bore witness to not only the horrors of war, but the maximum destructive capacity of man. But what many people may not know, and I actually didn't know, uh, was that there was a third destructive plutonium core lying in wait if the Japanese hadn't surrendered. And if they hadn't surrendered, then this core, which at the time was simply named Rufus, would have been fashioned into another weapon of mass destruction and used again on Japan to definitively and completely end the war. Oh, wow. Okay. So there was a third, a third core there, ready mm-hmm. to go? Yeah, it was ready. If Japan didn't oh, wow. surrender, they had Rufus ready and waiting to turn into another bomb that they would drop a third time on Japan and be like, look, that's it. You're done. Wow. What a name for a core, by the way. Rufus. Yeah, Rufus. Rufus. He's the man. <laughs> Deadly, apparently. But, yeah. Uh, oh, OK. OK. So go but, on. A- as we all know, Japan did surrender and there was no longer any need for rufus and a third nuclear weapon oh. but when it mm-hmm, but when it comes to radioactive spheres of plutonium you can't just toss those in the bin and ship them <laughs> off to a landfill right the core was instead kept at the los alamos laboratory using uh, plutonium and other nuclear substances, it it was still a fairly new concept. So they want to run further tests on these things to gain a better understanding of volatile radioactive forces. Uh, And the tests that we're going to discuss were used to see just how close you could bring a plutonium core to criticality. Uh, Sort of like to see if they could force a reaction without needing explosions, um, to see if they could force a reaction with far less plutonium so you don't need as much radioactive material, and just sort of determining uh, the limits of radioactive material in general. But 
uh, flirting with how close you can come to criticality, uh, that's sort of the hubris I was speaking of. This is like Icarus flying as close as he can to the sun. And even scientists at the time thought that these criticality experiments were such a potentially catastrophic idea uh, that there was this physicist by the name of Richard Feynman who had sort of this famous quote of stating that these tests on nuclear chain reactions and trying to achieve as close to criticality as possible were akin to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> yep, sort of like you don't tug on Superman's cape type of, type of stuff. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. So just just for my understanding, criticality, criticality being mm-hmm. like the absolute closest they can push something before well, when it goes it, when boom. It, criticality is like when it just, poof, the radiation spews out, right? Ah, um, okay. So you, you, you don't want that thing going super critical. You want that thing as... Mm, mm, mm. Um, and I think these cores were something like 5% away from criticality. So there's a little bit of a safe gap, but if you push it too much, there's not a whole lot of room for error. So uh, the first test on Rufus was performed by a man named Harry Daglian. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. At the Los Alamos lab on August 21st, 1945, which I believe was about a week or so after after Japan had surrendered. And what Daglin, Daglian was doing was he took Rufus and he starts surrounding Rufus with like these silver looking tungsten carbide bricks. And these bricks act as a neuron reflector. So they're bouncing neurons back and forth and they're bringing the plutonium core closer and closer to criticality. The more bricks you add, the more neutrons are reflected and the closer and closer it comes to criticality. So Harry is diligently working on this for the better part of the day, placing these bricks around the core. Uh, It almost looks like this sort of reflective fortress that he's building around Rufus. And the core is getting closer and closer and closer. But Harry keeps it at bay. And as it happens with humans, Harry needs to take a break. You know, he's been working all day tirelessly on on trying to bring Rufus as close as he can to criticality. Uh, So he takes a break, goes out, grabs some dinner. And after he finishes his meal, Harry decides, you know what? I want to go back to the lab. I want to continue working with this core. I'm not done with this core. But when he resumed his work that night, he was all Alone, He went back in alone, which was absolutely a huge violation of safety protocols at the time. You're never supposed to work on this stuff alone. The only other person that was there that night was a security guard named Private Robert J. Hemmerly, who was at his desk about 10 feet away from where Daglian was performing his experiments. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so he's in there alone again, and he he starts to do the same neutron reflector experiment. He's stacking these tungsten carbide bricks, these silver-looking bricks, all around the core, building and building. And Harry is inching closer and closer to criticality, brick by brick, closer, closer, until he's about to place one last brick And his measuring tools start going off. And they're like, hey, if you put this last brick down where you're about to put it, this core is going to go critical. This core will go super critical, and you're going to have just not a good time. So Harry's like, all right, well, I've, I've brought this thing about as close as I can. And he slowly starts to retract his hand, take that last brick away. And then his hand slips. Oh, no. The tungsten carbide brick slips out of his hand not only does it slip out of his hand it slips out of his hand and it drops right on top of rufus on top yep 
Ooh. right on top of Rufus. The core immediately goes super critical and lets out this brilliant blue flashing light before Harry quickly uses his right hand to throw the brick off the assembly. But it was too late. There was no possibility of Harry reacting fast enough to save himself from the dose of radiation that he had just been bathed in. And as quickly as he acted, uh, from all the reports I've seen, all the articles I've seen, it was said that the dose of gamma rays, neutrons, and radiation, the ones that he absorbed, it was actually greater than what a lot of people on Nagasaki had endured when the bomb was dropped on them. Whoa, 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 whoa. That, wait, that's... That's huge. So this core was effectively more potentially more dangerous than or could have been more dangerous than what was dropped. I don't know if it was more dangerous or if it was the fact that he was literally at the epicenter of a super criticality. He was right there. He was like staring right at it. So I don't know if it was necessarily more dangerous or the fact that he was just right there when a plutonium core (laughs) went super critical so for the next 26 days harry doglin would endure the painful effects of acute radiation poisoning Uh, the skin on the hand he used to remove the brick began to just basically melt away as it swelled and his organs slowly started to fail on him and what acute radiation poisoning does is it basically just you crumble from the inside out um at the skin on his abdomen essentially began to peel away and it's just not a fun time um, oh wow that and mm, it's 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 not it's not fun um his family was flown out to be by his side and his friend and boss uh lewis slotten Remember that name, please, uh, was constantly by his side and trying to sort of ease his friend and colleague through this absolutely horrible, awful, painful time. And finally, Harry would slip into a coma and pass away on September 15th. Uh, He was only 24 years old. And before Harry died, he did actually arrange to have his body donated uh, to science uh, so that they could better understand and study the uh, causes and effects of radiation sickness. And from what I've read, it seems like the security guard, uh, Private Robert J. Hemmerley, did not receive a lethal dose of radiation the way Harry did, uh, but he did pass away about 30 or so years later uh, from acute myelogenous, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, leukemia, which was more than likely brought on from the radiation he was exposed to that night. So 10, 10, 15 some odd feet away, he still felt it. He still felt it. Not as badly, wasn't lethal, and it wouldn't really affect him until like 30 years later, but that radiation probably would lead to him getting leukemia and passing away. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Radiation is no joke. Um, But back then, they didn't really know. They they didn't really know all the effects of radiation. They weren't, you know, um, they were doing hands-on criticality experiments. So... Uh, Safety protocols would be reviewed after the incident with Harry Doglian, and there would be some minor changes made. But from what I could find, it sounded like the changes only somewhat stiffened procedures that were already in place. Um, Like, according to Wikipedia, some of the changes included needing at least two people present, which was already a rule that Doglian chose to break that night. Um, Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, They required more instruments with audible alerts, which that was kind of already in place, too, because that's why Doglian was taking the brick away and didn't place it because his instruments were like, hey, you put that down and, you know, Um, there were some other changes like you had to have contingency plans for potential mishaps and failures during the experiment. But I'm not sure you can contingency plan for a slip of the hand that drops right on top of a plutonium core. 
And that ends up being the one thing that a lot of people can't account for in this world, isn't it? Human error. Yep. The, hum- the human element is the one that you just can't contingency plan for. But even with the reviewed and changed guidelines and rules for experimenting and all of that, Rufus would strike again. Harry Doglian's boss, Louis Slotten, the one I told you about, uh, was known for being somewhat of a showman and somewhat of a daredevil. Uh, he fancied working in blue jeans and cowboy boots. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so he 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 was known for his bravado. He he liked he liked to show off a little bit. Um, and from what I could find, uh, he was actually becoming agitated for the part he played in World War II and like the creation of the bombs. And and he was getting ready to actually leave Los Alamos and return to his old job as a radio biology and biophysics professor at the University of Chicago. But he couldn't and they wouldn't let him because he was still needed at Los Alamos because he was one of the few people with experience when it came to putting a bomb together. And so Slotin was known for a very specific type of criticality test that he liked to run. It was a very dangerous criticality test. Uh, Normally, the test he runs goes something like this. Uh, The core, the plutonium core, is placed between two half spheres of beryllium, which act as a a neutron reflector, much like the tungsten carbide bricks that Harry used. Uh, They just, you know, more neutrons get reflected closer and closer to criticality. And usually, there are these two little... They look like wedges. They're these wedge-like shims that are placed between the two spheres so that they can never fully close the core. Uh, Because if, again, if you close that, those two beryllium half spheres around the plutonium core, congratulations, you just woke up the dragon. Um, I've also read some articles that said sometimes for this test, they use this disc that was placed on the two half spheres so that literally the two half spheres can never, even if the shims were like just blown out for some reason, the disc would protect the two spheres and they would never, ever come together, no matter what. Oh, wow. So worst case scenario here is <laughs> uh, he completely covers Rufus. Yes. Worst case scenario is that these two half spheres of beryllium, foomp, close on each other and just boom welcome to criticality yeah no mas but again slotten is a bit of a daredevil and a bit of a showman uh not only does he take out the protective disc he also removed the wedges and the shim and so to do this test there is a little hole on the top beryllium sphere he holds that up with his bare hand from that hole and instead of using those shims and those wedges he uses a flat head screwdriver to put yeah. between the two spheres and he would just use his hand to slowly sort of jimmy them closer and closer together for the most accurate measurements he could possibly get This man didn't learn anything from. No, he really didn't. This is this is like Icarus to the infinity. This is really flying way too close to the sun. And as crazy and as dangerous as that sounds, Slotin had successfully performed this method of criticality testing over a dozen times times wow okay successfully a over a dozen times he had done this to like a whole room of onlookers and uh enrico fermi fermi i'm oh man i'm probably butchering that uh was a well-known physicist who also uh worked at los alamos uh, and he was reported to have said that if slotten continued to perform the criticality test in this dangerous manner he was sure he would be dead within a year. On May 21st, 
1946, Slotin was performing this risky experiment on Rufus in front of seven other people. Everything was going just as planned, the same way it went all those dozen other times. Until the screwdriver slightly slips from Slotin's hand and both half-spheres completely close around Rufus. A brilliant blue flash of light just emits out of this thing, and it was clearly visible. Even in uh, a well-lit room in the middle of the day, this flash is just blinding. And Slotin apparently acted really quickly and flipped the top sphere of beryllium off the core. And supposedly, that thing only closed for maybe a tenth of a second. He was that quick. It wasn't even closed for a full second. But in that short amount of time that those two spheres closed around Rufus, Slotin was dosed with over a thousand rads of radiation. Well over the lethal dose. And it was said that the first thing Slotin said after the accident was simply, well, that does it. Having been tending <laughs> Harry, Harry Daglin's bedside, he knew all too well what was going to happen next. And he knew exactly how gruesomely and inevitably he was going to die. <sighs> and yeah, it... Go ahead. Go ahead. Get it out. I, I, I'm just, listen, I'm flabbergasted. One. Two, mm-hmm. my intrigue is peaked beyond mm-hmm. measure. And it's, it, it, to be an eccentric, the confidence you got to have to do something yep. like that with a screwdriver. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. And and seven seven people. Seven people were in that room. And... Those people that were in the room, um, they tried to mark where they were standing at the time um, because Slotin wanted to try and do the calculations to see how much radiation everyone had been exposed to and more specifically, how many years Slotin had just taken off of everyone's life with his bravado. And it seemed that with the way Slotin was positioned over the core, uh, the other people were actually fairly lucky because Slotin essentially acted more or less like a human shield for the rest of the crowd. Like Mm. there was a man that was standing over his shoulder when this accident happened and he he received a lot of radiation. But because Slotin was standing in front of him, it wasn't lethal. And he was only hospitalized for like a few weeks before he was out and in relatively good health. Slotin, not so lucky. Uh, He was already vomiting and feel nauseous when they initially took him to the hospital. Uh, And apparently when he arrived, he told one of his colleagues that was in the room, he specifically said, I'm sorry I got you into this. I have a less than 50% chance of living I hope you have better than that. And while it seemed like he might have been getting better after a day or so, um, his hand, uh, the one that was holding the beryllium sphere up and was closest to the core, it started blistering and it started turning this really unsettling blue color as it swelled. Uh, And it seemed like things really started to uh, take a turn. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize there were pictures of it, but yeah, it is, it is radiation, acute radiation sickness is no joke. And it is, mm, 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 mm. but it seemed like things started to take a turn for the worst on his fifth day in the hospital. Uh, the medical report specifically noted that this was the point when his health uh, started to just rapidly uh, deteriorate. Uh, The radiation burns that he had received internally were described by the doctors as three dimensional sunburn, which is a sentence, I guess. Three dimensional Uh, sunburn. Oh, my God. Three dimensional sunburn. Uh, And yeah, Harry Doglian got like 200 
uh, rads. Um, and Slotten got a thousand in like less than a second. A thousand rads in less than a second is absolutely insane. Yeah, considering considering if if I heard you right, he he popped the lid. Yeah. In a fraction of a second. In a fraction of a second. A, f- a thousand in that time frame? Unbelievable. Yep. Uh, I believe the reaction is called uh, prompt criticality, uh, which is almost like this just instant thing. You can't react to it. Um, so and, and that's essentially what happens in nuclear weapons. They want that just instant like reaction that just foomp, immediate destruction. Uh, and Slotten would suffer much the same way Harry Doglian did until he finally slipped into a coma and passed away. And that would only be nine days after the accident. It only wow. took nine days. Three. Because because Harry, Harry was Harry, just over Harry, three weeks going on yeah, four. Harry was alive for, I believe, 24 25 days slotten got nine he got a little (laughs) over a week after the accident happened and after slotten's death the second from a hands-on criticality accident within less than a year protocols finally were reviewed and underwent like serious changes um it was no longer acceptable to perform hands-on criticality tests. If you were going to perform a criticality test, you would have to do it with a remote controlled device while any operators or viewers or researchers or whatever were a safe distance away with no threat to radiation if there was any sort of criticality accident. Uh, Slotten and Doglian's fate would not be repeated. As for Rufus, the plutonium core was melted down and returned to the United States stockpile uh, where it could be reformed into another nuclear core if ever necessary. And it wasn't until the aftermath when people started looking at all of the eerie little coincidences that led to the demise of Harry Doglian and Lewis Slotten, uh, like both events happened on the same day, Tuesday the 21st. Uh, Harry Doglian and Lewis Slotten died in the same hospital, in the same room, attended by the same nurse. And so, with all of these eerie coincidences, nobody referred to this as uh, accidents with Rufus. Nobody called it Rufus anymore. After all of this, that core was now only referred to as the Demon Core. Wow, bravo! That's that's wild. That's wild. So, what about the um, what about the other uh, the other five people in that room? Uh, they would eventually pass away from radiation related stuff, but it was way, way, way down the line. Again, it was kind of like uh, the security guard where it was like, yeah, 30 years later, uh, he would, uh, you know, develop uh, leukemia and pass away because of the radiation. But yeah, it, they all eventually did pass away from like radiation related stuff so eventually it did catch up with them but at least they had a chance to live a somewhat fulfilled life um wow but okay. obviously daglian and slotten were not so fortunate since they were like right at the epicenter of super criticality that's yeah that's that's crazy though so it, that's still that's still 10 people Yep. In some form or fashion, involved with this demon core, as it were. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And the radiation from these demon core events would eventually catch up with them. And it should be noted that Rufus, or the demon core, took all these lives, right? It was never detonated. The demon core never detonated. 
It wasn't like a bomb. It wasn't exploded. It wasn't anything like that. It never detonated, and it still affected all these lives. <laughs> well, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's. I'm. I've never heard of this. I had never heard of this until you 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 fed me the story here and. Mm-hmm conceptually a bomb went off without going off and killed 10 people yeah more or less it's crazy Uh, but again like it's and obviously there is no demonic presence about rufus this is all human error this is all overconfidence this is all uh hubris right but it's still just it's it's so eerie. And that's that's where that meme kept coming from. And I was like, where why why are people like memeing on this this demon core thing and, and a screwdriver and what is this all about? And it's it's all this crazy experiment that like you would never see today. No one would even consider doing something like that today. But again, and I believe I read that the reason they were doing such risky hands-on experiments is because you know world war ii was still going on slash japan was about to surrender and they were just like look we we need to figure this stuff out really quick if we're gonna weaponize this properly you know we need to we need to get our hands on this stuff and understand it really really quickly so you know what to hell with safety we have to understand this and we have to weaponize it now you know it for what it's worth it does fit the time period and yeah and a lot of a lot of what our that our like but the united states at the time their goals were with with a lot of this ty- uh, a lot of this testing and that's yep. that's 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 insane um it just reminds me of a of a of a quote a long time ago i don't remember where i've read it but that hubris is one of the great renewable resources oh. and that uh that, that is, is extremely self-evident here <laughs> that is a quote and a half oh my god i'm going to steal that cuz that's ooh yeah that's that that's a quote that's true in literally every every time period there's never a time where that quote is not relevant ay 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 yeah that's no good. kidding hey, i'm still i'm still mind blown by the screwdriver like this, this man worked with Harry and saw yeah. what happened to Harry. Full well knowing what happened to Harry, still decided mm-hmm. to put his hands on this core in such an absolutely like insane way. Like, and like you said, he he was he was at Harry's bedside. The, like as much as he could be, he saw exactly how it would progress and to still have that kind of bravado and have that sort of, I don't know, lack of judgment. Yeah, e- now, even here... even people at the time were like, hey, dude, you're going to get yourself killed doing that. Like, that's crazy. Even at the time, people were like, dude, that's not you are going to wake that dragon right up. Yeah, I mean, I look at it this way, because it begs the question. I have to ask the question. Do you think that Slotin was aware of his own mortality looking at Harry in the hospital bed, thinking to himself, this will happen to me? Or do you think maybe, just maybe, he was enough of an eccentric, where his hubris knew no bounds, that it wasn't going to happen to him. Like it's it's a weird twist of fate. Like do you think he knew this is how I, he was going to end up? Honestly, I don't think he thought he was going to end up that way. I I think he had such bravado that he was just like, "Oh no, like I'm I'm fine. Like I'll never make a slip up. I'll I'll just keep doing these criticality experiments." And I think when the accident happened, he was actually training a replacement to take his place in in the Los Alamos lab so we could go back to uh, the University of Chicago. And I don't think he he had any inkling that that would ever happen to him. I think he thought he was maybe not above it, but he was like, yeah, I'm I'm never going to make a mistake like that. I'm I'm you know, I'm a I'm a radiation cowboy, essentially, you know, I'm a I'm a 
yeah i think that he had that definition. sort of bravado and swagger about him that he probably didn't think it was going to happen you know what probably not and the more i think about it this is the definition of delusions of grandeur to see something like that and mm. think so firmly this will not happen to me is yeah. incredible that yeah, is cause... incredible delusion of the highest degree yeah because I, I don't know i feel like if i saw my friend and colleague go through what harry did i'd be like like i would i would have like this just like I don't want to say a burning bush moment, but it would just be this moment of like self-reflection where it's like, whoa, the stuff we're working with is, I mean, granted, World War II had just happened. They knew full well what they were working with. But at the same time, it's like, OK, wow, this is like right at home. This is my best friend. This is my colleague. Um, I I would definitely have taken a step back and be like, you know what, maybe, maybe, maybe more safety measures should be taken so that this never happens again. And yeah, it's just, it's crazy. Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. you know, but yeah, no kidding. Hindsight is indeed twenty twenty. That's wild. That's still wild. So this core was melted down mm -hmm. and to potentially to the U.S. stockpile. Okay. Okay. For the purpose, if they ever wanted to make another one, they could. Yes, 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 yes. If ever they needed another nuclear weapon. Because I guess after this is... Uh, are they going into... Co when was the Cold War? I don't actually know. Ooh. My history is not super great. Um, I want to say the 50s? 50s? Or maybe eh. the late 40s is when it started? Because it was so shortly heading, after World War II. Yeah, they're they're kind of heading into that territory, so they probably want to make sure they have that stockpile, just in case something absolutely crazy happens. <laughs> Time period. So yeah. yeah, I mean there was a Cold War arms race, and um, mm -hmm. I mean you can't you can't rightfully believe that no one outside of the U.S. and Canada was paying attention to something like this. Yeah, definitely. But that's that's the Demon Core. That is the, the 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 story of how the Demon Core took all those lives and was never detonated. That's that's really cool. Thank you, thank you for enlightening me on that one. I had never heard of it uh, myself. I think I saw a singular trend on social media, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I sort of wish I did, but at the same time, I'm glad I didn't because I, I, the whole time you were talking and telling me about this, I've got my hands on my face. My mouth is agape. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out like, does no one learn anything from previous iterations of testing? Like yep. Harry used bricks. You know what I mean? Like the man was playing Legos with a nuclear bomb and <laughs> And, and and then you have Slotten over here trying to put it in an eggshell. And in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, if you cover this thing, and I'm, I'm so glad I was right, hubris, here we go, yep. that if you close this thing fully sealed, and he's using beryllium, an entirely different element altogether than the tungsten, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's going to glow. And sure oh, enough, yeah. there it is. Yep. It, it it flashed the room. Well lit room. Still just pff, brilliant blue flashes. Wild. And I'm still reeling at the whole 3D sunburn thing. The man put the sun inside his chest. Yeah, he put the he, yeah he basically did. According to a book about the Manhattan Project, Slotten had volunteered for service in the Spanish Civil War, uh, more for the sake of the thrill of it than on political grounds. Uh, he had often been in extreme danger as an anti-aircraft gunner, and uh, in the winter of 1945 to 1946, uh, Slotten shocked some of his colleagues with a bold action by repairing an instrument six feet underwater inside the graphite reactor while it was operating rather than wait an extra day for the reactor to be shut down which got him non-lethally irradiated so he he just I, I guess he just he was cool with the danger like he might have known what danger he was in but it seemed like that's when he operated the best i guess i I'll, he I'll has a what. history of it yeah no kidding i would not have put being an adrenaline junkie 
on a physicist bingo card. That is <laughs> wild. Yeah, I I would not expect that to be the 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 bingo that was reached on the physicist card. Definitely not. Man, but hey, it, it seems. But at the same time, based off of that, it's it seems like it was a little more than than just being comfortable. Like he was familiar with with the process yeah, I mean, with what he needed what he needed to do and it kind of reflects back on the whole Icarus statement yeah this was his son yep this this was this was the son that burned his wings unfortunately so that'll that'll do it for the demon core um so thank you everyone for listening hopefully you enjoyed um we'll catch you on the next broadcast. So thank you again for tuning in to Unidentified Signal 99.9 FM. And before we go, on behalf of the uh, studio staff and my co-host Slap, uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. And don't forget, sleep where they can't find you. (laughs) 